So welcome to the publication session on academic pediatric surgery in the digital age. Um, I'm Mary Edwards. I'm from Albany, New York. I'm the current chair of the publications committee. And Todd Ponsky, who needs no introduction, is my co-moderator. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, our first speaker is really, there's probably no one better literally in the world to discuss the topic of editing pedi or authoring pediatric surgery uh, manuscripts in 2019 than the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. So without further ado, uh, Whit Holcomb. And while Whit's coming up, so this is kind of a funky session. So this actually was two sessions, and there was some real overlap, so we decided to merge it together. So as the talks go, it's, you're going to see it starting to shift towards some of the more modern stuff, ending with Ben really taking us to the future. You're using you're the, so much And so time. you're the oldest, you like the most, <laughs> like the <laughs> archaic way first. Right. Yeah. You've already used 10 seconds. Let, let him go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Um, so I am the uh, editor of the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. Uh, I think Mark Davenport's in the audience, too, who is our uh, editor for the British Isles. I'm, I don't know if it's hard to see if Miko Pakarinen's in here, who's our editor for Europe. Uh, and there's several other uh, editors of journals who are at this uh, meeting. Uh, so it's a real privilege to be asked to uh, give this talk. Uh, although I am the editor-in-chief of JPS, this talk really represents my thoughts and are not necessarily the perspectives of our, uh, of our publisher. And some of the slides here have, t have I've taken or borrowed from other people's presentations because I, I think this is an interesting topic and three or four years ago I'd never given it and so I've given it a few times now and I've used several people's talks. Uh, uh, Jante Karpolowski uh, is here from uh, Sydney. I've got some of his talks I've used or slides. I, Todd's contributed, so it's sort of an amalgamation of, of information that I think is helpful to uh, everyone. So in writing a, a manuscript, uh, I think it's important to uh, prepare appropriately. Uh, and to prepare appropriately, we need to uh, do a literature review so we can see what else has been done uh, on this topic. And then getting started. Uh, is really, in my opinion, is really the hardest part of writing a manuscript. I even think it's, it's difficult myself, and what I actually do is I'll close my office door and I'll dictate uh, my thoughts, and, and it's really hard to, to get started, and so for me, that's the way I do it. Many of you probably started a keyboard, uh, but whatever, you, whatever suits you, uh, the hardest part, I think, is getting started. And it's easier for me, at least, to edit the uh, manuscript rather than to write it the first time. Uh, I think an outline can be very helpful to organize your thoughts. Uh, and writing the abstract first uh, can also be a helpful way of getting started. Uh, so for me, I, I want to dictate something, really dictate anything. And then I'll uh, end up editing it. And, and at least for my own work, I edit it. Uh, five, five, six, seven times before I actually submit a paper. So the, the, there is a format to, um, to organizing your thoughts with the introduction, the methods, the results, and the discussion. And the introduction says, uh, why did I do this? The methods are, what did I actually do? Uh, results are, what did I find? And then the discussion is, what uh, does it mean? And so the introduction needs to awaken the reader's interest and really to motivate the reader to care about um, uh, what the manuscript is about. Uh, and this is a, a, a nice slide that uh, displays the outline of an introduction. So it is possible to have an organized approach to your introduction. Three paragraphs. The first one can state what the general problem is or the current situation is. The second paragraph can say, what is the specific problem or the controversy that the paper will address? And then uh, the third paragraph is, how will this particular study uh, address the gap uh, between what is known and what is not known? So the methods need to describe uh, what was done or, or how the paper or how the uh, manuscript uh, was done. And you need to balance the brevity uh, with uh, completeness. Tables can be helpful uh, if it was a fairly complex uh, methodology. Uh, sometimes appendices can be helpful as well. 
And also it's important to not to uh, forget the relevant uh, approvals, whether it's IRB or human <laughs> subjects or animal work or whatever. And then the results describe what did you find. It should be short and to the point. You need to distinguish the primary results from secondary results. Uh, you also need to guide the reader through the various figures and tables uh, that uh, support the data. Uh, but it's also important not to interpret the results uh, uh, at this stage. You just state the results. And then uh, the discussion is really about um, describing the central findings of the paper. Could it be wrong? If so, why? Uh, are there limitations to the study? And what, uh, what do the results mean? And how does or how will this information improve uh, our patient's care? Now, um, the discussion can also um, uh, be organized in about five paragraphs. Uh, one of the things that I find as, as being an editor is that oftentimes manuscripts are, are way too long. And so if you, if you follow this outline, you can um, summarize and discuss your results uh, in about five paragraphs. The first one can uh, summarize the findings with respect to the hypothesis. Paragraphs two and three can place the context of the paper uh, uh, with other work that's been published and compare and contrast the data with other known data. Uh, paragraph four can address the limitations of the particular study, uh, and then paragraph five can be put uh, your work in perspective. Is your work generalizable? Uh, will it work just the same in Des Moines, Iowa versus Munich, Germany? Uh, and what are the implications or the next steps of your, uh, of your findings? Now, having written your, your paper, uh, I think it's important to try to get feedback early and often. Uh, get some fresh eyes on the paper. You can ask a colleague, a friend, even your spouse to read it and give you feedback. When I was just starting out, uh, my father is a surgeon and I would ask him to read my work and, and I had to develop thick skin because it was all marked up. There were red marks everywhere and obviously back then there was, everything was in paper. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I, th I thought I was a terrible writer and at the time I thought I was a pretty good writer. But if he couldn't understand it, and he, he, did, he was a surgeon, but he didn't grow up and do laparoscopy or MIS or all that stuff, if he, if he couldn't understand what I was trying to say, it really w must not have been very clear. So anyway, it helped me a lot to have someone else uh, read my work, uh, and you can too, and whether it's your next door neighbor in an office setting or a close friend or even your spouse, I think it, it can be helpful to uh, get fresh eyes on your manuscript, because after a while, uh, you've read it so many times yourself that you just sort of can, me you've memorized it and you know what you're trying to say, but it's important to say what you want to say and that's why it could be helpful to get uh, someone else to look at it. So you've published it, excuse me, you've, you've written it, uh, and then you need to decide what your audience uh, should be. Uh, do you want a general interest journal or do you want a subspecialty journal? And in some folks' mind, the journal impact factor is important. In our particular country, in the United States, I don't think the impact factor is that important. It's more of the audience that you want to uh, send your work to. But certainly abroad and in many other countries, the impact factor is important. Um, and finally, I, I, I implore you to read the instructions to the authors and also to follow those instructions. You would not believe how many papers are submitted to our journal uh, in which the um, authors have not followed the instructions. Uh, and especially the references. Uh, our journal has a certain way to uh, compose the references and you wouldn't believe, I bet you 70%, 75% of the papers that we see, or at least that I see, the references are not in the correct order. And it makes you think, well, did they A, read the instructions to authors, or B, did they submit this to another journal and it got rejected and so they're therefore submitting it to our journal. Uh, so I think it's important to realize that uh, different journals have different instructions for authors, especially the references, and so try to follow that particular journal's um, uh, instructions. Now, getting it published. Um, 
I think the most common reasons uh, a reviewer does not think a patient should be, a paper should be accepted is either there's no new information, uh, the statistics are not accurate, or the paper is poorly written. So regarding no new information, uh, I think it's important to ask, did you perform a thorough re literature re review before starting? Because I think the, most of the reviewers, or certainly many reviewers, actually do a literature review when they're actually reading your paper. So it's important to realize that they know what the relevant literature is, and so it's important for you as the, as the author or authors to know what the current uh, literature is uh, and not to be submitting a paper in which the literature is already uh, well described. Uh, make sure others haven't recently published something uh, similar, but even with a larger experience. Uh, and also make sure that your information in your paper uh, adds to value and knowledge to uh, pediatric surgery or to surgery in general. Now, poor statistics. Uh, if, if you are not well versed in statistics, and I would actually be uh, uh, in this category, and many of you are, it seems like our younger group of uh, surgeons are much more well versed in statistics than the older group. But if you're not, please ask a colleague or a statistician, a colleague who's well versed in statistics or a statistician to help you with your paper. Because that is one of the reasons that reviewers uh, do not feel papers should be uh, published. And to me, this is my main pet peeve, is the paper is really poorly written. I told you earlier that I'll put something down, but I'll edit it six, seven times before I submit it. In some papers you can read, and it's obvious that the senior author never read this paper. And I think it's incumbent on uh, those of us who are senior authors to read uh, the papers that are submitted with your name on it. And also, you, you help out your junior colleagues, whether it's a resident or a a junior faculty member, you, you teach them how to write a better paper. Uh, so I think it's incumbent on the senior authors to take uh, a lot of ownership on the papers that are submitted with your name on it and from your institution. A paper could be poorly written because of the English grammar or a, a syntax with multiple spelling and punctuation errors. Uh, this is a little bit more uh, towards our our colleagues or some of our colleagues abroad in which English is not your primary language. Uh, but I think if English is not your primary language, uh, and we certainly want to encourage you to, to submit your papers, then you ask uh, someone who is uh, well versed in the English language, or you get an English uh, language uh, person. Uh, sometimes you have to pay for that. But you get somebody to uh, help you with the English language. Now, as a corollary to what I just said is, at least my impression is, that a clear, well-written paper, regardless of the topic, is usually viewed more favorably, favorably by reviewers, at which means it's more likely to get accepted. And so this is really the most common reason, I think, that a paper uh, is uh, not accepted, is the, it's poorly written, with number two uh, being that it's not new information. Now, once you get the reviewer's comments back, if you're allowed to um, revise the paper, uh, then it's important to summarize each of the comments from the uh, reviewer sequentially and state your response. Uh, it's also helpful to acknowledge and thank the reviewers for any positive comments. Uh, and when you do make changes and you respond to the reviewers, uh, please indicate what changes you've made uh, in response to each reviewer's comments. And it's also uh, helpful to highlight them in the manuscript. So what I suggest you do, you, you do if it's possible, is you send two, two manuscripts in, one with the highlighted changes and then another uh, in which the changes are not, uh, or excuse the highlight's not there. But it's also important not to argue with the reviewer uh, because ultimately the reviewer uh, holds the cards to whether your paper is, uh, is published. So a couple of uh, slides on closing tips. Um, and these are like my, my closing tips or my tips to, to getting a manuscript uh, published. To me, the abstract is very important uh, because often the readers don't read the article, they just read the abstract. And you need to create some excitement about the data and try to grab the reader's attention so he or she will, um, 
will want to read your article. It's also sometimes easier, as I've mentioned, to write the abstract first because it does organize your thoughts. Uh, and writing an outline may be a good way uh, to get started and also allows you to organize your thoughts if you have trouble getting started. Now, it's also important to make sure that the data in the abstract is exactly the same as in the paper. You wouldn't believe how many times you read a paper and you go back because you don't think the numbers in the paper are the same as in the abstract and you look and it's, it's 347 patients in the abstract and 359 patients in the paper and, and it just goes downhill from there. And, and so if, you, if, uh, uh, if your numbers aren't accurate in both places, it, it does, uh, it does you, you do worry about it as a reviewer that is this data really accurate. Uh, another thing is to make sure the concluding statements are supported by the data. There are a lot of MIS type papers in which are nicely done uh, and then in the conclusions, even in the abstract or the paper, they'll say and something like, and the cosmetic appearance is, is very pleasing when in fact the word cosmesis is not in anywhere else in the paper. So if you just sort of added that as a concluding statement, I think we all agree that uh, MIS probably probably has a better cosmesis than an open operation, but you really need to actually prove that uh, and just don't add that into a, to a sentence that's not supported uh, by the data. Make sure that the tables and figures are informative uh, and that they add to the paper. And again, be sure the references are in the correct uh, format for the journal. Uh, so with that, um, I'll uh, wish you all good luck. I've noticed Dr. Ben O'Ure just came in, who's the editor of the uh, European Journal of Pediatric Surgery. Uh, so he's a good person to talk to and get to know. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed uh, the, and Dr. Piero, I think, walked in here. Uh, August, uh, Agostino is the, uh, one of the editors of PSI. Uh, so it's great to have uh, all of you editors in here. and and. Uh, the audience members ought to take advantage of their presence and perhaps afterwards go up and say hi to them and ask them their thoughts as well. Thank you. So we're going to hold questions until the end. Um, okay. Our next presentation. Actually, do you want to do the tribute, right? Isn't that next? No. So actually, uh, our next presentation is going to be a tribute to Dr. Edward Free. No, so we'd like so to ask. This is being presented. Uh, this Let video was made by Alex Kassar. Because its mother was in a jam, said the voice on the phone. His name, Dr. Edward Allen Free. For someone with such royal pedigree, this man was really hard to find. But through a series of phone calls, he was able to tell his story. He was born in Wyoming in 1924, relocating to Iowa and then Utah after the Great Depression. In Provo, he attended Brigham Young University High School, excelling in academics, sports, journalism, opera, dance, and theater, and ultimately joining a Navy V-12 program to attend college. He served in World War II and the Korean War. He began pre-med in Albuquerque and transferred to Colorado before enrolling at Stanford University Medical School in San Francisco in 1945, where his mentor, Dr. Roy Cohn, advised him to go east for surgery. Dr. Free believed surgeons lacked diagnostic skills, so he completed a medical internship at Bellevue Hospital before embarking on surgical residency at New York Hospital, covering his own expenses with mining stock he had bought with $100 he made in high school. His interest in pediatric surgery developed after a TF case no one knew how to fix. He connected with Dr. Gross after a lecture and followed him to Boston to arrange for fellowship. It did not go well. He applied again and was accepted to train under Dr. Koop at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He returned to Stanford in 1959, leaving shortly after for further training in pediatric thoracic surgery under Dr. Sampson at the Children's Hospital of East Bay. At the end of his training, he built a pediatric surgical practice at Children's Hospital of Oakland all by himself. He was active in multiple organizations, becoming a founding member of APSA and PAPS and a member of the annual uniform pediatric seminar with the AAP. He credits the foundation of APSA to Dr. Lucian Leap, whose idea to put together an organization for pediatric surgeons was shut down by Drs. Gross and Coop as impossible. With perseverance from the juniors, a meeting was held near Chicago and the organization was born. 
Dr. Free's personal purpose was to bring the surgeons of the East and West together at last. Looking back, I would say that goal has been more than accomplished. He is now enjoying retirement with his wife and dog in Arizona. For future generations of pediatric surgeons, this is his advice. Follow the three A's for success as a consultant, availability, affability, and ability. Without them, you have nothing. Surround yourself with partners willing to learn new things and embrace technological advances. During his time, those challenges were endoscopies of specialization and mannequin simulations. And lastly, embrace education as a two-way street. Support the training of U.S. surgeons abroad and foreign surgeons domestically to expand the knowledge and skills in pediatric surgery globally. Children will be better off because of it. Thank you, Dr. Free. Thank you. And that was by Dr. Alex Kassar. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sandeep Kaswami, who is a professor of surgery, pediatrics, and OBGYN at Baylor College of Medicine and is the director of surgical research at Texas Children's Hospital. He's going to talk to us about developing an academic portfolio. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for this privilege. If you will indulge me just for a minute, let me just ask a couple of questions. Um, if you're a resident, a student, a fellow in the audience, raise your hand. Okay. If you're a full professor, raise your hand. Okay. So I just, um, you know, this talk is obviously geared a little bit towards the younger crowd as we're trying to get promoted. Um, but to make it fair, I try to put some pearls in there for everybody. So something if you haven't seen before. Because what we're going to transition to now is talking about developing your academic portfolio. And what the academic portfolio is, is it's a list of your accomplishments and your achievements. Or in other words, it's saying how great you are saying this is what we've done, this is what we've accomplished, this is what you've accomplished. And so that, I think, there lies in the problem because as pediatric surgeons, surgeons in general, I don't think necessarily we're the best self-promoters. We just go around our day making our work. And you really need to take this academic portfolio and make it the best you can. So how do we do it if this is not a natural talent for us? Well, there's certainly some role models out there that can help us in saying, how do you do it? So for this guy, he just says, it's great. And you could do that one strategy. or let me give you another way, because I don't necessarily know if that's going to work for you. So yeah, this is a very dry topic, so I try to make this as entertaining as possible. Um, historically, um, for, the, for the, the older generation, this is a document that reflects your teaching, research, and service performance. It's, this written, it's basically your CV. But what has evolved over the last 20 years, at least in my opinion, it's not just the what and when. You had these people in your lab, or you trained this person, and now, you know, from this time to this time. It's more of the why and how. You trained them, it was part of a program, you developed this curriculum, they've now gone on to do this, and you're really showing how things have evolved and why and how you did it. And so for the sake of this talk, I want you to start thinking maybe a little bit differently and say, is the academic portfolio in 2019, not just an academic portfolio, but we're going to call it the e-academic portfolio, because it really is an all-encompassing multimedia portfolio of all the things you accomplish. So let me tell you what I mean by that. Certainly you know your CV. That's got to be a big part of it. But there's other parts of it as well. Your website and how patients see you, part of how that is manifested, your CV will be on there. Also, social media, and I won't say too much because Dr. Ponsky and Dr. Momi are coming up to say it. There's metrics out there online that you have to kind of manage, and also your professional network, whether it be through Doximity or LinkedIn, what have you. And all of this, if you think about it, is part of your e-academic portfolio. So no matter what the reasons why it's changed, because there's many that we're going to hear about today, the number one reason to have a great academic portfolio is because you want to get promoted. Now the problem with this, wherever you are on this track, once you start hitting assistant, associate, full professor, you need to submit your packet to your promotions board so they can approve you. And it's very difficult for me to give you real advice on that because every institution is different. If you know one, you know one. But what I can tell you, at least for our institution, when you get promoted, you get more money. So it's a reason to get promoted, but it's not the reason to get promoted. But it's certainly what is talked about. The other part that is frequently talked about with promotion is tenure. Now, this concept, this is the definition of tenure. This concept kind of eludes me because I think it's great for like the English professors. I don't necessarily know what it means for us in this generation because I see professors getting pushed along all the time and so I'm not sure where the protection is. But with that being said, I think there's some historical significance and people really um, um, put some stature to it. So people think about promotion and tenure. 
But what has changed and what has made us think of maybe this e-academic portfolio is our environment has changed. The digital age is here. Two-thirds of patients actually look through search engines as they're searching for you. If you have a bad experience or a bad online rating, you lose, start lose patients. And even social media, 40% of people are using this. And so in this whole world, as we're sitting here today, people are searching about you. We're sitting here having this conversation. They're looking at you and your profile. So at the end of the day, if you're trying to build who you are and what your academic profile is, then you have to have all of these things to counteract it. It's the only way you can control the narrative. So with that being said, the end goal, at least for us, is to build that academic portfolio because what it says to patients is this is why you should come from, say, Saudi Arabia to Houston to have your surgery. Because these are the things that we want to specialize in. These are the things that run through my CV, my portfolio, that say why I'm a specialist in this. And when you do that, you build centers. And so now, and the theory is if you have centers, you have more patients. More patients is better care. Better care is it's just self-fulfilling prophecy. And so it's this concept of using your academic portfolio to promote your practice, not just get promoted. And I think that's new today. Now what I tell my fellows and the postdocs is an academic portfolio is like granite. Now this shows how domesticated I am. For anybody that has um, redone their kitchen or built a house, everybody's smiling. It's actually painful. Um, and you're, you're now like saying that. But I want you to look at the left. And this granite, if you know it, this is the cheap granite. This is the low level granite, grade one. It's not that there's not a bunch of points on there. So this is the work that's been done by this individual that generated this portfolio, this granite. It's not that they didn't work. But you look at that and just go, eh, it's kind of blah. It's low level. On the other hand, the level three granite. It's shiny, it's clean, but most importantly, it has these veins running through it. It has these points where they've started coalescing. It gives it a striking appearance. So think about it. So for me, you know, I do fetal surgery, I do fetal wound healing, I talk about basic science research. Those are my veins that run through my CV. And when you pick up my portfolio, you should say, oh, this is what this guy does. This is what his interest is, and this is where he's going to make his impact. This person right here, no impact. That person right there, impact. If you don't want to believe me, even the NIH has adopted this philosophy. So in 2014, um, when you used to submit a biosketch, who submits a biosketch here? Who uses the, uh, does anybody use biosketches? Oh. So biosketches are what we used to send to the NIH when you, instead of sending your 70 page CV, you send a five page biosketch. And what they used to ask for was the top 15 manuscripts. So you'd give a little blurb and you'd give your 15, man, your 15 manuscripts and we would look at it as reviewers and go, oh, that's interesting. And then you just kind of move along looking at the top 15. What they ask you now for is they say, list out your five areas of impact. Tell us where you've made some change and then write a paragraph and then add four articles that support that claim. And what you're doing is making your five veins. So this is something that even they've tackled and taken this approach. But I will tell you, and this is totally a tangent, but if you do, if you do use biosketches, so when you have to collaborate with somebody and say, oh, give me a biosketch, there's a website called Science CV. And this is basically a web portal run by the NIH that once you, it'll take you a day to do your biosketch, but once you've done it, when someone comes to ask to collaborate with you and say, oh, by the way, because the usual answer is then give me a biosketch, this will generate a biosketch in 30 minutes and it will be perfectly formatted, but most importantly, tailored to that project. And it's really, really impressive. So this is one of those pearls. If you have to use biosketches, this is the website to use. So let me transition to some more of the more traditional elements of the academic portfolio. Research, service, and teaching, because these are the common elements required for advancement, because this is where we make scholarly activity and this is where we have our impact. Again, my disclaimers of institution specific, depending on what track you're on, so I'll keep it very broad. Now, before I get into that, no, because it's so institution specific, if you don't read the rules, you'll be like Patrick here, because all your friends are going to be getting promoted and not you. So you have to understand what your institution has to say and how you're going to do it. And I knew that. My mentor told me that when I came to Cincinnati. He said, hey, read this so you know what you have to do. I encourage everybody to do that. What I didn't know, and he didn't tell me, and it was actually Dr. Wesson who's sitting in the back, when I came to Texas Children's, he said, oh, by the way, you're supposed to save everything. So every piece of patient um, uh, card that you get, some, um, something from the residents when they evaluate you. Um, I, when I give this talk and I get some kind of critique back about how bad it was, you keep all of those things. Of course, you discard that one. But you keep all the good things. Keep all the good things. 
So for documentation, as we're going to keep it, um, you want to preferably keep this as a running list. You want to list all the courses that you've taught, what peer review you've done when you're, when you're reviewing for Dr. Holcomb and JPS, you want to be writing that down. Your student evaluations, your clerkship evaluations, if you're doing um, educational projects, uh, the resident training that you do, but you can't, it's no longer good enough to say, oh, I train residents. Who they are, how many hours a week you did, how you did it, what the content was, all of that should be in your portfolio. And if you do it once, you just kind of build on it. It becomes very easy. And of course, if you're re mentoring and through research, that is certainly teaching. We talk about clinical teaching. You establish your area of expertise. Give talks about that as you're um, educating the public. You do interviews in media. And of course, when you write review articles, all of that can be considered part of your teaching documentation in some institutions. As we move to service, it's about clinical productivity. You know, for me, I, use, I usually keep a track of how many RVUs I've done every year so I can make a graph out of it, and that's how I track it. I take care of the, when I get a nice note from a patient or a nice note from one of the, the staff, I'll, I'll make sure it lands in my folder. If you're on administrative or committee roles, if you're doing quality and safety projects, mentoring junior faculty, and of course when you're developing practice guidelines, which we do, but you wouldn't think about putting it on your EAP, but you should. And of course, as you're serving the community through education. I mean, research for me is fairly obvious, but you were trying to show independence. You want to be in peer-reviewed journals. As you present at meetings like this, you want to get a leadership role if you're doing research. You serve on your thesis or dissertation committees. And then, of course, obtaining grants. And those are the standard cadre of grants. You want them to be peer-reviewed, independent. The foundations, the, the, the federal foundations, the foundation grants, the society grants. And then, of course, I like to put on the competitive institutional awards because it shows for the junior people out there how you're making a track record of getting funding, even though it's intramural. So now that you're here and you've got all of your academic portfolio going, how do you know when you're ready to get promoted to associate professor or what, more importantly, are they going to look at? Well, it's really your impact and it's through your publications and it's through your contributions, it's through your national recognition, your commitment to the service in the school at various levels, and then, of course, how you had leadership roles. But one of the questions that I get asked the most is, well, how many publications do you need? Because everything else, you're like, okay, well, I'm, you know, I, I can say I'm nationally recognized. I have some commitment. I've done my committees. But how many papers is enough? And to be honest with you, every institution is different. But I do like this one piece of data from my good friend, Ash Kosain. He used this thing called an H index. Um, if you know what the H index is, raise your hand. Okay, so 50-50. So the H index is basically this gauge of what your impact is as an individual. And what it equals is it's the number of papers you have for the number of times, it's the minimum number of papers you have the, to the minimum number of times it's been cited. So for example, if your H index is 20, it means you have at least 20 papers and they've been incited each at least 20 times. So he looked at this study of 450 academic pediatric surgeons in the U.S. and what he found was that assistant professors had 10, so that means they had 10 articles in print that had at least 10 citations. So you can write all the case reports you want and have 100, but your H index can, if they never get cited, your H index is still like one or zero. Associate professor, about 15, and full professor is around 25. So when you get 25 papers cited 25 times, that's the average number in the U.S. And this is just a little bit behind where the, where the, um, where the scientific, you know, the biologists, et cetera, are. So it's not, not that far. So let me finish off with my seven tips for building your academic portfolio. No talk, of course, would be complete when you talk about portfolio unless you have a good mentor. And I would highly recommend, um, if you have, don't have one, find one. It makes it easier. Can you do it on your own? You can. It's not as easy. Um, those qualities of people that are generous with their time, their interest, they really care about you. And of course, they have to know what they're doing. They have to have that wisdom. And I would be remiss if I didn't re recognize Tim Crumbleholm and Brad Warner and my old chief, Pat O'Leary, um, who really, they're like the Yodas to me, even you know, as a full professor, I get mentored by them um, continuously, so I appreciate that. But I highly recommend that. Two, track and record your metrics. So this is a little bit different. We talked about H index. Who knows what the altmetric score is? Raise your hand if you know that. Oh, okay, at least one thing I can say. Um, and there's some individual qualitative metrics, which are obviously individual, but I'll, I'll tell you what mine are. So the index, we, H index we've talked about. So what the altmetric score is, is a new score used by the publications where they're looking at how much, how buzzworthy it is. 
And so what that means is they're looking at how many news articles picked it up, how much Twitter um, activity there is, how many times it's blogged, et cetera, throughout all these different things. And it generates these numbers. And basically what they say, and this is from their website, a score above 20 is good. You're, you're, in their words, far better than its contemporaries. So we published this article in Science a couple of months ago, and we have an altmetric score of 541 because it got picked up by that's a lot of things. Alan Flake published in 2017 the, the fetus in a bag. It has an altmetric score of 4,096. It's like crazy. I mean, that's like, you know. But that's also, you know, and you also now know how much interest it generated worldwide and actually maps it out by country. So you can know exactly who's reading your articles. It's pretty cool. I wrote this bottom paper with um, Alan Goldstein, my good, good friend Alan Goldstein and Dave Hackham, about the challenges to being a surgeon scientist in annals. And it generated an altmetric score of 374 because there were so many of these reviews about it, so many editorials about this one article, that it basically just drove up the altmetric score. And if you think about it, when you're going to your promotion committee or when you're going to your chief and saying, look at what I'm accomplishing, it's this kind of stuff that they need to see because this is not the classic. This is why this is in 2019. Now, individual metrics, you know, for whatever you do, you do, and you got to figure those out, but it's not traditional. Maybe you just count your RVUs. For me, when I was first starting my career in Cincinnati Children's, I was trying to make myself known as a fetal surgeon. So to show that, I had to show I was doing fetal, you know, cases and consults. So I would track how many fetal consults and, diag and the diagnosis is that what I would see. And so that actually made it into my portfolio so that people could look at it. So if you're doing trauma, maybe you include the activations. If you're doing um, um, the number of casais, then how many I mean, casais, then you say how many casais if you're doing cancer, et cetera. And then you can show that in your portfolio to show this breadth of what you do. So when I say, hear me roar, and this is why I'm great, you have to have some data behind it. We go back to documenting and tracking your service, and for the more junior people out there, it'll start with your service, and you'll start with instant, institutional committee memberships, which then goes into society memberships like um, um, APSA, your ad hoc review for JPS, your committee chair as you move on, the editorial board, and then when you get to the end, you're in study section. For research, it's starting off with first and middle um, publications, and then it goes to the career development grants, Regional speaking are your first invites, so you know your local NICU, local um, ACS state chapters, et cetera. You get onto independent funding if you're on the research track, and of course you get onto national, international speaking, and then of course the ultimate is that you mentor people through research. When we look at teaching, this is actually um, where Dr. Wesson helped me the most because while I've been teaching in my whole career, I wasn't really documenting it, and that is where I would tell you because when I had to start making my portfolio. It's quite challenging. If you, you will get it done, but it won't be as good as if you started doing it from the get-go. So having a philosophy statement, saying what your five-year goals are, and then looking of who you're teaching, how you're teaching it, when you get assessed, what's your curriculum development if, you, if you've done that, mentoring and advising, the educational leadership, and if you make enduring materials, that also is included in that, that teaching track. Of course, networking whether it be through the e-networking or networking at meetings like this, participate in societies. I expect everybody to get up and ask a question after this. Introduce yourself to others. Develop your relationships. Of course, be active on social media. And lastly, now this is obviously important because I've said it now four times, it's all about your institution. So you know the timeline, follow the rules, get your mentor on board, and above all, start planning early. So I'll finish here and I'll say what can you do today? So one, when you're out in the bar tonight having that glass of wine, think about what kind of granite you are. You level one granite, are you going to be level three granite? What's that, what's that portfolio going to look like? If you do biosketches, use Science CV. If you don't know it, when you do it, you're going to send me an email going, wow, how did I live without this thing? Read your P&T requirements, well, not today, but when you get home. Routinely track your teaching, research, and service. Because if you try to do it all at the end, you end up missing it. It doesn't look as robust, and it's 10 times harder. Know and develop, most importantly, develop your metrics. If you're in some fields, the metrics are already there, but develop your own. Who says you, we're pediatric surgeons, we get to do what we want. Say what, say what defines you. Save everything. Thank you, Dr. Wesson. Serve on committees, present your work, and I put this last line in here, don't pass up on the international opportunities. Because what was told to me, and I think is true in a lot of places, what's the difference, because we talked about getting promoted to associate professor, but how do you become professor? Well, at the end of the day, what I was told, it's more of the same, except you have to have an international reputation. 
So don't give up on those international, and even if it costs you a little bit, take, take that opportunity. You'll not only enjoy it, it'll be good for your long-term promotion. So I want to thank you, and I look forward to questions at the end. So our next speaker is my co-moderator, Todd Ponsky, who's a professor of surgery and also the director of clinical development and translation at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. All He's right. going to talk to us about the digital disruption of academic medicine. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of fantasy here and talk about where things are going in the future. So let's say you're... It's going to be a question for you guys now. So let's say you're on who wants to be a millionaire. You don't know the answer. You got three lifelines. One is they remove half the choices. Two is you can call an expert. Or three is you can ask the audience. Who here would go with 50-50? 50-50. Who here would say call an expert? Call an expert. Who would ask the audience? A few of you. Okay. We're going to get back to that later. I'm not giving you the correct answer right now. So academic medicine is absolutely the cornerstone of medicine. It is what we live, eat, and breathe. It's how we stay alive. It's how we move forward. But I'm telling you, a lot of this is going away. A lot of this is going to become obsolete, and we need to pivot and realize where the heck the future is going, because it's not going to be a lot of this. So this is the basis of academic medicine. The purpose, I think, is to disseminate knowledge worldwide. The purpose is so that everyone around the world can learn, right? Would you guys agree or is there disagreement with that? Agreement. And that only works if those who do the work get recognized. Now, I, some of us say, no, no, that's not true. I do this because it's good for the world. Okay, well then publish anonymously and see how many publications we get out there. We want to get recognized for our work and right now we're not doing either of these very well. So let's talk about dissemination of knowledge. How are we doing? Would you say that we are spreading knowledge equally around the world? I would argue that we are absolutely not spreading knowledge equally around the world. That is pathetic to me. That in 2019, there might be disparities because of financial resources to buy the best OR, but knowledge should be equal. There's no reason that in 2019, in the digital era, knowledge should not be equal. It's because of access and money, because most education costs money. That is horrible, in my opinion. It has to happen. I'm not saying that we can just get rid of the cost, but I'm telling you that is something we should strive to change. So I read this book. Has anyone read this book, The Age of Acceleration? Bunch of you, okay. Thomas Friedman, writer for the New York Times, he talks about that we are now in this new age of acceleration, that everything is rapidly changing, much faster than it's ever changed before. So we've heard a lot about this already today, the Moore's Law. Who's heard of Moore's Law? Now almost everybody's heard of it. Gordon Moore, just going to tell you the story again. Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, noticed that computing power was doubling every year. That the computer that was the size of this room was half the size the next year, half the size, half the size, and now it's on our wrist. And he predicted that this would continue on forward, and it did. So who cares? So what? So things are doubling. We love it. Technology's growing. You're laughing. Have you heard of this story? Yeah? Okay. You guys have heard the story. I'm going to tell you again. Suffer through it a second time. Okay. The King's Chessboard. A guy... Has anyone not heard this story? Okay, I'll tell it. So, this guy invents a chessboard, and he takes it to the King of India. By the way, I found out part of this is actually a true story. So, takes the chessboard to the King of India, and, he, and the King says, this is the most incredible game I have ever seen in my entire life. What can I do to repay you? And he says, all I want is rice. And the king says, how much? And he says, let's play a game with my chessboard. So what I want you to do is put a grain of rice on the first square, two on the next, four, eight, double with each square. I'll take the rice and go home and give it to my family. The king says, no problem. So he starts putting rice into it. And, and he realizes that you know, the second row is getting a little hairy because a big number doubling becomes a massive number. And when he gets to the second half of the chessboard, the palace room starts, the whole palace fills up with rice. And then the entire country of India fills up with three feet of rice. That's the power of doubling. So when someone just tells you that things are doubling every year, you better recognize that this is no joke. 
that doubling is massive. By the way, uh, back there, this uh, talk's gonna have a lot of audio. I don't know if I told you. Cool. All right. So we recognize doubling's an issue that we need to recognize and deal with. By the way, 18 quintillion pieces of rice, if you wanted to guess. Uh, but other things are doubling, not just computing power. Everything is on this acceleration curve. So things are gonna change because being on an acceleration curve changes everything. So computing power, technology, patents, guess what else is doubling? Our world, medical publications have reached the upswing of exponential growth. They are, we are now on the second half of the chessboard in medical publications. 30 years ago it wasn't a big deal. Now we are exponentially growing. What do I mean? In 1950, they would say that it would take 50 years for the amount of publication of medical knowledge to double. It would take 50 years. It accelerated. So then in 1980, they're like, oh, we take that back. It's seven years. It's seven years, we'll be doubled. And then in 2010, they're like, oh, well, we take that back. Actually, it's three and a half years. In three and a half years, all of medical knowledge will double every single year. And now they're saying that in, every, in 2020, every 73 days, the amount of knowledge in Medline in pup, will be doubling every 73 days. Okay, it, that is impossible for us to be up to date. I remember Davenport, when he's heard this talk the first 15 times, I remember when he, I said, who in the audience says they're up to date? He's the only guy who raises his hand. Right, Mark? True story. He's raising it again. Okay. So the problem is this. When Kaswani publishes a paper that's a massive, important paper that we all need to know about, it's camouflaged. So now we're sitting at our conference and we're all talking about papers and none of us are talking about the same paper because there's too much out there. There used to be like you all knew the Sentinel papers. There's no such thing anymore. So it's impossible to know what to know. So when my dad finished medical school and then got to the end of his career, yes, things were growing, but it was manageable. This is us now. How is that going to be manageable? We have to rethink our strategies. We have a much bigger knowledge gap now, not knowing what we're supposed to know. So Thomas Friedman says that if things are accelerating and you're in a kayak and the, the water starts moving fast and you just put your paddle in the water, you will flip over. You will flip over. We can't just sit with our paddle in the water. Now we realize the problem, now we have to rethink about what we're gonna do because we can't sit still and think that things are gonna work the way they've worked the past. My argument is that I think digital is gonna solve a lot of these problems. I'm gonna give you a few examples. How do we get knowledge into the heads of doctors? I think it's this, it's the matrix, right? We take pediatric surgery and we just implant it into our head every single week or whatever often, right? Here we go, that's the answer. <laughs> okay, we're not there quite yet, but until then. Billionaire entrepreneur have you guys seen Elon this? Musk has launched a new startup which will work to implant artificial intelligence technology into the human brain. Well, oh, I screwed it up, sorry. The ultimate goal of this company is to merge man with machine, fusing human intelligence with artificial intelligence to bring humanity up to a higher level of cognitive reasoning. Musk has been calling this brain-computer interface technology Neuralace. In essence, Neuralace is an ultra-thin mesh that is implanted into the skull and forms a body of electrodes which are able to monitor brain function. Neuralace should enable humans to upload or download information directly from a computer. <laughs> so it's a little crazy, but not that crazy. Elon Musk just invested in it. All right. Anyways, that was just for fun. All right. So back to reality. So how do we stay current? This is how we stay current. Textbooks, medical societies, and journals. I am arguing, sorry, Wit, and all the editors of all the journals, I don't think you guys are going to be around in 15 years. I think journals are going to be totally different than they are now. I'm just predicting that we need to anticipate that the system for journals in other areas is changing and I think it's going to end up changing in ours and for us to stay current we're going to have to realize what's changing and adapt. Okay? I do think we're going to need the entities but it's not going to be in the form we see them now. I read this book, oh by the way, if you have an iPhone and you hold your phone up and you just aim it at your camera app, if you aim your camera app at any of these, anytime I read a book that I like, I'll put the QR code and you could download the book. Okay, so this guy says that the three things that are going to revolutionize everything are machine, platform, and crowd. So instead of textbooks, societies, and journals, we're going to have machine, platform, and crowd. 
machine, I mean artificial intelligence platform I'm going to show you, and crowd I'm going to show you. So machine learning, we talked, you always heard about AI today. AI is the new hot topic, so I'm going to skip really fast to this. I believe that AI, which basically means, does anyone not know what AI is? Okay, I'm going to skip it because we have short on time. I believe we're going to need artificial intelligence to solve this problem. So we are actually trying to figure out, so the other problem, by the way, is not just too much information. We read these journals in the United States. Sorry, Benno, I don't, yeah, okay. So, so in this, in this country, we read usually these journals. The problem is the best stuff is not published in the journals that we read. So how often do you page through Cell Science or Nature? Probably not that often. So that's the great journal paradox. We don't actually see the best stuff that's published. Um, so the, there's better stuff in surgical journals, and then there's medical journals, and then there's those. So we don't see it. So I want to create a filter, an AI filter, that can figure it out for us. So we're working on this. We're working with our data scientists to try to come up with a solution of a calculator. This is Abdul Arouf Lamoshi, who started this project, and we're for the sake of time, I'm going to skip forward. QXMD, I just found this. I forgot the QR code. It's QXMD. They have created an AI algorithm that's doing this. They're, they beat me to it. It's amazing. I downloaded the app and they'll send me articles and they are in random journals like gastroenterology, but it's exactly was the article I actually wanted. So it was, it's a really, they're, they're heading in the right direction. They're from Australia, I think. All right, back to this. You want to know the answer? So. Phoning a friend, well, so the 50-50 gives you a 50% chance. Phoning a friend 66% of the time, your expert friend that you think is an expert will actually know the answer. The crowd, 91%. The crowd is always right, <laughs> not the experts. The experts are right some of the time, but the crowd is going to be often more often than the experts. So this is the answer. This guy, Francis Galton, everyone ever heard of him? Francis Galton takes an ox to the 1890 State Fair. He says, how much do you guys think this ox weighs to 800 people? And they guess, we think it's 1,197 pounds. It was 1,198 pounds. This study was just repeated two years ago and they found the exact same result again. The crowd is always right. So let's use the crowd a heck more often than we already are. We have to embrace the power of the crowd in a million different ways. We're only going to talk a little bit today about academic medicine, but bringing the crowd is the future of everything, I think. YouTube does it. That's how we take care of five billion videos because of the crowd. It sources it for us. And finally, we're going to end on platform. Something happened in 2007. In 2007, out of nowhere, there was a platform revolution. And everything had to be rethought. Stuff that we thought we understood had to be rethought. Industries were taken down overnight because these platforms were smarter than the ways we were doing things. Now, the greatest holder of content doesn't own any content. The greatest taxi company in the world doesn't own a single car. The largest seller of merchandise doesn't own a single product, and the largest hotel chain doesn't own a single room. Platforms have rocked our world, and it's time for us to see how it's going to affect medicine, because I guarantee you it's going to happen. This is our platforms. We publish and we stand up here at a podium, because that's how we think we're going to get knowledge around the entire world for free. And I will tell you that that is not going to work. It's important. It's going to always be there, but it's not going to be how we solve the problem of true knowledge dissemination and democratization. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to share. We have to learn how to start sharing, sharing content. We need to re realize how people are digesting content, and we need to start sharing it. We need to start using digital mechanisms. I'll tell you, my guess is all three of these won't be the primary mechanisms in the future. But the idea is, right now, there are mechanisms to share digitally. We need to learn to share. But our attention span has changed. We used to read War and Peace. And we say, now, forget it, I'm going to go watch the movie. Is there a movie, War and Peace? I'm going to go watch it. And my kids say, I swear to you, this is a true story. My kids will not go to the movies with me. I have a 12, a 13, 7, and 6, uh, 9, and 6 year old. They won't go to the movies with me because they say it's too long. I don't want to sit through a two hour movie. I want to watch a six second Vine video. My kids can't handle something longer than three minutes. So we're like marathon runners. Instead of giving people information that's like a 
bucket, we should be giving information that's like a cup. We should be realizing that the best way to disseminate knowledge now is not through massive amounts of information, but bite-sized pieces of really rich, important, curated content. That's how we're gonna get content around the world. We have to rethink the way we've been distributing. So by the way, this is kind of cute. YouTube average two minutes, Facebook is one minute, Twitter average video is 45 seconds, and Instagram is 30 seconds. This is the new thing. And by the way, the most rich content is not paper anymore, it's all these other things. So one example that we've done through JPS is if we take a journal, instead of reading the journal, we've decided, and the journal's not that long, but we can't read every single journal anymore, we put it in an infographic, and that's happening everywhere. Ben's doing a great job putting infographics, that's one way. If I'm talking fast, it's because I got two minutes left. We've made videos. We've made videos because it's rich content. This is an example. If we find something that we're, so we're sort of curating. If we think that's something important, we make a video. This is an example. This is Todd Ponsky with the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, and today we're going to address a hot topic of debate in the operating room, which is the safest headgear to wear in the operating room. Is it this? Is it this or is it this? Well, this question was just answered in a recent study called Hats Off, a study okay. of different operating So these are not here. easy to make. They take a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of takes. It, it looks like it happens right away, but it does not. It takes forever. Okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so it, it, it takes work. Okay, but then once we make the videos, we put them all on Facebook, Twitter, whatever mechanism, YouTube, whatever we can find. We just distribute it around the world. We have 15,000 followers now on Facebook in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. So, uh, my fellow just presented last year at Sages. It was a huge ballroom. Maybe there was 300 people there. Okay. A, a week later, we posted this and have 50, reached 51,000 people. So you tell me who's winning the war, podium or platform? So who does not like Facebook? <laughs> Raise your hand. You can be honest. If you, okay, I, yeah, I know you're out there, okay, because it's not. But so I will tell you, I agree with you. So here's, if I'm going to try and predict where the puck is going, I'm guessing that Facebook will not be really the primary platform because of trust issues. So what can we do? We need to start creating our own platforms. We need to start figuring out what works for us that we can feel safe and trusted. So what if we can have a feed of new publications from the journals you choose, crowdsource to determine the most popular articles, have video reviews of the top articles, a video library of surgical videos, treatment guidelines, a communication portal so we can ask questions to each other safely, audio chapters, get CME credit, and it would be free and democratized around the world. So we've been working on this. I would say it's in a work in progress, uh, but we're trying to figure out how can we reach the world. So we joined together with Kansas City, Journal of Pediatric Surgery in Cincinnati, um, put together this uh, attempt at trying to define the new platform. Last year we published in Science Translational Medicine. What do you do with a hundred day old infant that presents? It's a very familiar question to be honest. Uh the only thing that's attaching the lesion, and so the assumption is, is that there's a vessel in there somewhere.
So it's free. Uh, go try it. Please let us know how bad it is. We want to know. So I think ultimately this is how we can get red arrows everywhere by getting knowledge free around the world. And finally, the answer is this. If you're going in fast moving waters and you just put your paddle in the water, you will flip over. There is a way to stay afloat when the waters go really fast when you're kayaking. You know what that is? You have to paddle faster. That's the answer. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. So our next, uh, our next uh, um, thing is a, actually a tribute to Dr. Soper, and this will be by Numa Perez and Maggie Westfall from Boston Children's Hospital. There was a visiting doctor from South Africa, and he began to talk to Bob about pediatric surgery, and Bob's eyes just lit up. So September finds us sailing to Liverpool with four little children. He loved doing all different kinds of surgery, and I think that, you know, the peds, even today, is more of a general surgeon than general surgeon. He was a man who loved babies. There's nothing that he enjoyed more than holding a baby. There was no pediatric surgeon in the entire state of Iowa, which made it very tough for Bob. Most of the surgeons in the state of Iowa saw no difference between an adult and a baby. And it was an education thing that Bob had to do. And of course, he had to be very political because if he fussed at these GPs, they'd go to Mayo's. So he didn't, couldn't fuss at them. He had to educate them. He was proud to be from Iowa and in Iowa, and he didn't want to uh, leave and have no one there. He showed us how much he loved it, um, despite the hours and things, and I think that meant a lot. The only thing he did outside of work um, was hang out with his family and play tennis. Every meeting, this co group of cohorts would get together and play tennis, and they had such a good time. And this whole group of naughty boys would supposedly would cut out in the morning as soon as soon as they had a little breakfast and take off for wherever we were for the tennis courts, and then come sneak in late. <laughs> he was uh, a very compassionate surgeon. I was with this old guy who didn't know that I was uh, sober, I don't think. I don't think he put two and two together, but we were walking down the hallway and Dad went the other way, and this guy, this other older janitor said, you know, that's Dr. Soper. He's the only one here who knows my name. We went to Puerto Rico to take those boards, and I've never heard such a bunch of liars in my life. All she said, get on the plane. Have you studied? No, 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 I haven't studied. And of course, being with the wives, <laughs> they were chuckling up their sleeves saying, never heard so many lies in my life. <laughs> they were to death, studying, studying, studying. I think it was a tremendous relief that they were recognized now, and they were very eminent men older than Bob, who were the, the real fathers. He was passionate about pediatric surgery and passionate about the organizations that, that supported it. He believed in it and he believed in the power to change. My dad was really proud of the APSA and, and the whole thing about surgeons finally getting together to certify the subspecialty in the United States. And from that point on, I mean, they knew that they were recognized and it was an honorable society. It was not just an offshoot of surgery. And that made all the difference in the world. So our, our final speaker, sorry, is Ben Nwame, who is the program director at uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital, uh, and he's going to talk to us about social media 3.0. Yeah, thanks. Um, I know that many of you are dying to find out what impact factor is. Um, so this is kind of a play on impact factor and, um, and uh, you, you know, the Twitter-derived impact factor. Uh, so that's here, yeah, Twitter impact factor. Uh, I have no disclosures. So first I want to start with some definitions, uh, bibliometrics, which uh, we've sort of talked about. Uh, Sandeep has talked a little bit about 
um, impact and uh, you know some of the scholarly metrics that uh, these are derived from. So bibliometrics refers to the study of quantitative aspects of the production, dissemination, and use of uh, recorded information. And uh, we are all familiar with traditional uh, bibliometrics, uh, which um, uh, sort of uh, depend on uh, citation-based uh, metrics, which at the general level, uh, everybody is familiar with impact factor. And the author level uh, metrics, uh, which uh, he also talked about the age index. And uh, uh, you know, many people complain about uh, problems um, with the citation-based uh, indicators. They are too slow. Um, you know, some of the influential work um, remain unsighted. Um, and then there is issue about impact. You know, whose impact? Uh, you know, what what impact? And you know, whom do they affect? Um, uh, they don't always capture the context. And uh, you know, Wait has told us that we shouldn't worry about uh, impact factor in this country. Uh, they, they remain very critical for uh, people in universities across the world. And we all know how impact factors can be gamed by some journals. Um, and uh, you know, this is one of the, an illustration that shows uh, some of the problem with impact factor. Uh, so the impact factor is calculated over a two-year uh, two window, but we know that most articles keep getting cited for many, many years. Uh, most biomedical journals, they, um, uh, you know, cited half-life for the average uh, article is usually about six to eight years. So, you know, while you are waiting for your paper to be cited, uh, the impact factor is calculated over a two-year period. So that's uh, sort of a disadvantage for, to most uh, journals. Um, so there is also the matter of uh, impact on whom. Uh, we sort of exist in a bubble, you know, where you know, we're citing our papers and we're creating an impact within the scientific uh, community. Um, but are we worried about impact on you know, patients, the public, uh, policy makers? So this is why um, uh, you know, the alternative metrics which uh, Sandeep uh, you know, talked about um, has been created, uh, the so-called alt metrics. Um, and you know, this is definition uh, using online tools and environments. And I'm not going to go too much into this because uh, we uh, kind of already talked about it. Uh, when you see uh, any of these signs, uh, these are some of the companies that have sort of taken on these alt metrics. Uh, the uh, the company uh, the company alt metric. This is actually a company uh, the, which is the most popular of all these companies that utilize the alt metrics score. And uh, Sandeep has already also talked about this altmetric uh, uh, donut. Uh, and when you see a number like this, this is really a very high altmetric uh, score. Um, and he's given an example also from one of his publications. Uh, if you have written an article that has an altmetric score that is very, very high, uh, count yourself very, very lucky. But as he also said, uh, if you uh, have an altmetric score on one of your articles that is not uh, this, this high. Uh, do not be very dispirited. In fact, I'm going to give you an example with one of my own articles, which uh, racked a very, very pitiful score. So, so this is an example of an article. And you know, if you do one of these things where you check out the altmetric score on one of your article, uh, so you click from PubMed, and then you go to your general article, and then you get 24. Uh, you say, oh my God, you know, I'm going to score 24. But you know, I tell you this, so, so what I did was I saw this 24, and then I then looked at this right here. It said, you are in the top 5% of all research outputs scored by altmetrics. So even with a very, very pitiful score of 24 for this article, I was in the top 5%. So, um, uh, so don't be dispirited when you see a very, very low score. Like Sandeep said, anything above 20 is actually pretty good. 
So the one thing to realize is that um, e even though we've, we've given you the critique of the traditional um, citation-based um, uh, impact, you know, citations, uh, people have problems with it and they say we should use alt metrics. Uh, and alt metrics gives you attention based on Facebook and Twitter and all that. Uh, but attention is not exactly the same thing as impact, right? You know, so it's not all or none. Uh, I think we still live in a citation-based world. Uh, your universities are still going to uh, assess you based on citations, uh, but I think we need to kind of keep both um, in mind. Okay, so Twitter. Um, so uh, Twitter is here to stay, um, and it is you know, part of what we are going to have to do in order to generate attention. And if my cousin, uh, Jeff Opperman, were here, he's going to say, are you for real? Uh, so, you know, many years ago, people were making lists of, you know, surgeons to follow on Twitter. And believe it or not, there were actually many pediatric surgeons on this list. And um, uh, Nick Christoph, who, as uh, many of you know, is a journalist uh, with uh, the New York Times, uh, published this editorial, um, you know, several years ago. And he was very concerned about uh, the lack or the seeming lack of public intellectuals or shortage of public intellectuals. And he was concerned that many uh, scientists, especially people in the biomedical world, were shrinking from participating in public uh, discourse. Um, and uh, he, he recognized that part of the reason was because uh, many of these academics were worried that their own colleagues uh, would, uh, would criticize them for engaging in frivolous, what they would co consider frivolous distraction from real research, you know, if they were to co participate in, say, you know, discussions on public, uh, uh, you know, social media. Uh, you know, this was exactly, I think, about five years ago. Uh, and I tweeted at that time that, you know, perhaps if they did that, that they could be penalized uh, if they pontificated on Twitter or, or, or Facebook at that time. Um, I, I think I was a little bit self-aware because, you know, if you look at the list I gave you on the previous uh, page of the surgeons to follow on Twitter, I think I was the most junior of all the surgeons that were uh, listed then. Uh, but since then, if you look at all our recent uh, APSA presidents, uh, uh, actually all of them are on Twitter right now. Uh, so it seems like, uh, uh, you know, Twitter has become mainstream within pediatric surgery, and I don't think we have to worry so much about that now. Uh, and certainly a lot of, uh, you know, scholars are on Twitter right now. So these are the Twitter-based metrics uh, that we now have to um, be aware of. So what are tweetations? So anytime that you tweet a complete link of an article, that is called a tweetation. And I would define twin pack factor and twin index. So it does really turn out that if you write an article and people are tweeting about it, that that Twitter activity will predict that your article is more likely to be cited. So this is what it looks like. So if you write an article and people start tweeting about it, so people are going to likely start tweeting about it as soon as it gets published. And citation will follow months and years afterwards. And what the data shows is that the highly tweeted articles are 11 times more likely to be cited than the less tweeted articles. And the top cited articles can be predicted from the top tweeted articles with 93% specificity. And tweets can highly predict highly cited articles within three days of the article publication. So you've been waiting for it, the twin pack factor. So it is defined as the cumulative number of tweetations within n days after publication. And you can also apply the same concept to Facebook uh, you know, or blog posts. So you can you know, further define is that you know, TW7 or TW10, depending on the number of days um, you know, after uh, um, of a number of uh, tweetations after the number of days of the publication. And then there is the uh, tweetation index, uh, which is a way that you can rank the number of articles that are 
um, articles that are published, say, in the same issue of a journal. So let's say you take the May edition of JPS, for example, and then you can determine the twin power factor of all the articles that are published in that edition, and then you can rank order all those articles, and then you can assign a twin index for all those articles. So these are the way that you can use the Twitter metrics to um, uh, you know, apply to all the articles that are published for, say, a particular edition of, uh, of a, a journal. So, um, so it turns out that you know all the caricature of Twitter. You know, the caricature was, I don't want to know what you ate for breakfast. Uh, you know, has now turned out into you can actually use uh, Twitter in a much more serious way that will impact your scholarship. Uh, so that's what Twin Pack Factor is. Thank you. Any, why don't we just do this right now? Since, or does anyone have questions for Ben since he's up here now? Go ahead, Ben. Phil or Samir. So Phil Gorg from Buffalo. So I'm speaking with the hat I've been wearing for the last four years as chair of the faculty senate at the University of Buffalo, and um, all of us love when our articles are tweeted. We love it when we get attention. We love it when other people read our stuff. But when I'm worried about faculty getting promoted, people really don't care about social media. And I think you have to be very careful um, about what your presidential review board at your university or what your particular promotions board at your school in your university cares about. Um, if your tenure track faculty then social media isn't important. If you are clinical faculty and you don't really give a hoot, then the more people who can read your articles and the more colleagues, can, the better you are. But um, I, it's just sort of interesting listening to this whole discussion about, well, who's the audience here? And I have to tell you, as pediatric surgeons, we want to publish in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. But if you're doing basic science, you're wasting your time. You really want to publish in nature and science and, and you know, scholarly journals. So, and then pediatricians don't even read it. But it's just sort of, it's just sort of interesting. It depends on what your career path is going to be. Ben, you're a great, um, you've done great things with social media and pediatric surgery, and you've got all of our presidents tweeting, um, <laughs> which is which is nice. Um, but I think you just have to know who your audience is, and um, you know, for gun safety, our audience is the public. For you know basic science, it's the nerds. So, thank you very much for your talk. So well said by the guy who got me tweeting in the first place. <laughs> Samir, nerds tweet too. Um, so I have a question for you, Ben. That all your talks were fantastic. So thank you very much for such an outstanding panel. My concern with social media, Ben, is. You can buy a thousand followers for something as low as fifty dollars, and that could be forty-nine percent, fifty percent of those could be authentic followers, and fifty not. So, how do you, how does alt metrics, or how do all these metrics take into account the fake followers, the hashtag fake news stuff? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I acknowledge that in one of the slides that these things can be gamed. But, you know, you can also game citation impact factors. Journals game it all the time by writing editorials and writing a lot of review papers, and then they can jack up their impact factors. So all these things are prone to, to being gamed. So I think, you know, you just have to be careful about how you interpret all these numbers, whether traditional or alt metrics. And by the way, this is, we can ask, we have the whole panel here now, so yeah. if you have questions for, for Wader Sandeep. Um, thank you very much. I mean, this is a very, uh, it's a very interesting uh, panel and discussion that, that, that we are having. My concern is similar to that one. I mean, this uh, tweeting without uh, uh, perhaps a, a way of, uh, of scoring or way of <laughs> assessing the quality of what is tweeting is uh, is worrying you know when you submit an article to a journal 
it goes to the editor, the editor asks for reviewers, and then the process continues, which is a process which has been there for, for a number of years. Now, uh, measuring the impact on the basis of how many citations, how many people have read that little bit may not be adequate to, to make any real judge on the scientific quality of that, uh, of that um, paper or whatever you publish. So I, I'm just a little bit uh, scared about this because there is no great deal of, uh, of checking uh, the quality of what is out there. So that's, that's my, my main concern. And measuring the impact of something in medicine may not take just one year or two, it may take longer. You can have a randomized control trial, it may have an impact in uh, subsequent years, which is not measured by tweeting necessarily that. I'm not saying that we should be against it, absolutely not, but I, I, I wonder if this is a real problem. Okay. Next comment. Um, I stand to make an admission and an announcement. My admission is, is when we put the program together for APSA, I was a little bit skeptical about this session, and I was 100% wrong, because all four of those talks were tremendous. And I will say, as a reviewer for the JPS, and I don't do it very much, but they um, give me articles every once in a while to review, I would really emphasize that people in the audience, both young and old, uh, Take Dr. Holcomb's talk, which will be available on the APSA website probably in a couple weeks, and highlight every one of those bullet points and check them off when you write a paper. Every one of those is really important. So thank you, Dr. Holcomb, for bringing those forward. Uh, Casey, thank you. Ed Taggy, Loma Linda. Uh, Todd, I'm really interested in your app. Who's doing the filtering? How are you going to be reviewing all these thousands of articles? Are we all going to just end up being kind of homogenous in what we're, we know because we're all looking at the same app? So you just hit on what I think is the biggest need, and I'll tell you what we're doing, but we have a lot more work to go. Um, I, right now we're using a feed of only the pediatric surgical journals. We could add every journal, but that would be too much right now, and it's crowdsourced. So. However many people like it, it rises to the top. A lot of complaints about that, okay? Some people love it, some people think, is that crowd the right crowd to be deciding what we should be reading? Also, we're missing all the journals that are not in the pediatric surgical. So what we're gonna do is reach out to that company in QX or de design with, with our, hopefully our protocol, we'll be able to use natural language processing to say, this is a good article, this is one that should be in the app. <laughs> Right now, I don't, and I'm very open to suggestions if someone knows how we can better curate. It almost might be you have to subspecialize your app. So here's the inflammatory bowel disease. Well, here's uh, here's, the here's, what? here's the inflammatory bowel disease. Here's short gut. Here's oncology. Here's quality. Here's so, right, so we have that already built in. Um, we wanted to wait till we had enough people to make it worth. So now when you go into settings, it says, tell, tell us what your areas of interest are, and you would get a feed only of those articles. And also in the but community. Only from pediatric surgery. Yeah, for pediatric surgery. You're saying outside of pediatric surgery. Right. We're doing that too. Yeah. So we've, we're making an ENT one, and uh, it's going also. But this is just pediatric surgery. But I'll, I'd love to talk to you after, because I'll take any suggestions. Hi, I'm Janet Meller. I have a question about every day we, about your dissemination of knowledge. Every day we get, <clears throat> I don't know if you get, but I get in my email box 1,000 solicitations from journals. My guess is they're from other countries because they're, the English is poor or whatever. Are we, how, how is that gonna impact on how our articles are being published when there's this huge amalgamation of choices that maybe younger, are younger um, authors or younger authors to be wouldn't know how to use. So when you say you're being solicited, are you being solicited to review the articles? Yeah, to, write, to, to send. To send one in. Send okay. one in. So, if yeah. you're, so let me just make one comment. Part of, let me explain why there's an explosion in publications. Number one, there's been an explosion in predatory journals. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Open access predatory journals are now everywhere and that's causing a lot of the noise. The, the second thing is everything is digital now. 
So there's not as much of a limitation on how much you can publish now because we don't always have to rely on paper. So that the digitization <laughs> and the, and the pub growth of the predatory journals. That is why I am saying the current system doesn't work because there's, we're being, there's too much camouflage and noise from these predatory journals. So we have to have a system that's probably going to use either a combination like YouTube does of crowdsourcing, a combination of AI to help use natural language processing to determine which articles are best. I guarantee you something's going to have to, to do this because right now it's impossible. Eduardo Perez, Miami. I actually had a similar question. Uh, but I want to see anybody on the panel, how do you, like, we stick to uh, index journals where we publish or review. I've been told, you know, just ignore any open access source, but I mean, it's getting higher and higher. How do you see it in education, just going up and, and, and ranking? Um, is it something that's looked at? Because again, we tend not to just, just ignore it, but I mean, it's out there. I would say from the, you know, certainly the NIH is fully aware of the, the issue of predatory journals, and when we're reviewing, we can know what they are. But this term that open access equals, you know, a bad thing isn't necessarily yeah. true. There's, right. you, can, you can purchase, if you want to publish in FASIB, a very respectable journal, Journal of Biological Chemistry, you can, uh, you can purchase open access. And I do that for my higher profile work so that way people can, can cite it for free. So you're disseminating it. Now you have to be in an institution that's going to pay for it, hopefully. So I think that that's, those are still reasonable ways. Um, but there's definitely, I think, you, that emails you, the emails that you get to solicit you, those are pretty, they're not, you may not even get published, meaning like you may send it in, you may pay the money, but that's probably their first edition. So they have to get enough articles to actually get published. So for the most part, I'll, I'll speak broadly, when you're getting solicited by these things, the same as when you're getting solicited to give a talk in China, which we get, I get five a day. Um, those are probably not true. With that being said, I got one from South Korea that really was a real one. So you have to be careful that some people are actually trying to get you to come speak about your work. So be open-minded and at least make it through the end of the email. Uh, Mr. Zani, uh, Toronto, Kids, Toronto. Um, as Todd and, and uh, Dr. Holcomb knows, um, we actually tried to do some videos, uh, very similar to what Todd has done, of any, with very different magnitude, and we've just published three videos on uh, basic science uh, um, um, articles published on the, in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, because we thought, okay, it would be very interesting for, uh, for, the, for the mass to actually be able to understand also basic science papers. And again, uh, it was, we, we picked uh, the ones that I thought were uh, most interesting. And so my question to you was uh, more or less along the same lines of uh, uh, the previous question, whether there was a system uh, within the association of having like a Delphi um, uh, system whereby you would decide, there would be not just a single person, so not just you or me deciding uh, which paper to discuss and to have it, um, um, a wide, wide uh, discussed uh, on, on the social media, um, and instead having a, a panel of uh, experts uh, in different disciplines, because in fact uh, we take the pride of uh, really operating from uh, top to toe, and so you, you need experts, uh, and it could be clinical or it could be basic science papers. And I, I was just wondering whether there was a system you were thinking of uh, uh, to implement so that uh, the, the, these exercises that you've been doing and I, we're trying to keep, keep, keep doing uh, uh, can, can progress. Yeah, I think that, first of all, your videos are great. And it was funny, the debate you and I had is that I thought nobody wanted to hear basic science videos and you said you're wrong. And they did want to hear basic science videos. I think, I mean, you're, everyone's hitting on the right point. Um, we, the, the point is we need to get a group of us together to figure out uh, Real, to realize the problem and start thinking of curation ideas about how we're going to, like when you make a video, you're basically telling everyone this is one that you should be paying attention to. This is an article that's important. Um, and as far as how to, you know, and then we have to figure out ways of disseminating it. So it's content creation, it's curation, and it's dissemination. I was relieved to see that actually you had to take a lot, to, you had to have a lot of takes. It took me much longer. <laughs> oh, it takes a lot of takes. It take, yeah, 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 it yeah. takes a lot of takes. <laughs> Mary Arnold from Cape Town. Thank you to the whole panel for exceptional talks. My question is to Dr. Um, Holcomb. 
with such ex exponential growth of literature, how, what is your advice to, to somebody junior in terms of intellectual property and acknowledgement of other authors in terms of managing references? How do you give credit where it's due, but at the same time when there's so many articles out there without having a hundred references for, you know, for, for one or two points, how, how do you cope with that? Well, um, my suggestion for that is for you to pick the articles that you think are the highest quality, uh, perhaps the highest level of, of evidence, and cite those. I don't think you need to cite, obviously, a hundred articles for one sentence. But if in certain situations there's, you know, one or two or two or three seminal type articles or, or easily the top articles in that one particular uh, area or, uh, or topic, and I think you can cite those. That, that's, that would be the most practical way, I'd tell you, to, to try to figure out which, are, which papers to cite. Hi, Peter Liebert from New York. Uh, you might be interested to know that my wife, Marianne Liebert, whom I'm sure <laughs> you know as a publisher, a medical publisher, uh, was approached by a journal to write an article. Uh, they ac actually addressed her as Professor Liebert, and uh, she wrote a nonsense article for one of these predatory journals, and they agreed to publish it. <laughs> so the, qu the real question is, uh, do we have a way of identifying them so that uh, we don't get caught in this? That's a great point. <laughs> I mean, you, it's a, go ahead. Yeah. I have a particular bias on this topic, and it's not just uh, the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, but it's all the pediatric surgery journals that are peer-reviewed. Uh, and I, f I really truly believe that the peer review process is vitally important. Uh, in, in not only disseminating appropriate information, but in also protecting our patients. Uh, and so my, my suggestion is not to uh, participate in journals that are not peer-reviewed, uh, because I think that peer-review process is so important. And when we're actually, you know, we are taking care of other people, and in our field it's babies and children, and I think we need to have the most unbiased uh, uh, literature out there that, that we're, we're predicating our, our, um, our treatment of those patients. So my, my, my plea is to, whether it's my particular journal or, or all the other fine journals in pediatric surgery, is to pick a, a peer-reviewed journal. Thank also you, one that's probably good next to PubMed. I mean, that's a good way to know. If it's not getting indexed in PubMed, then you have to question about what's happening there. Yeah. Hi, Bruno Martinez from Mexico City. Uh, this is a couple of a question and a suggestion. Do not over specialize the app, the creator aspect of the app, because if you get a, I get a colorectal paper to review, maybe it's very important for me that I do colorectal, okay. but maybe not for the, for the public. That's the first one. Second one is how are you going to manage the access to the articles? Maybe it's not a problem here in mm -hmm. the United States, but maybe you are aware of Sci-Hub. It's a very important tool for everyone around the world that doesn't have access to a, okay. an article. So you, that is a big problem that exactly. we don't have a solution for right now, that we can't give away the articles, the journals can't give away the articles. All we can give away is the abstract, and if you have a membership, you can do it. And that is a problem, but I don't think there's an immediate solution unless we can figure out a different business model. Wit? So I think Wit's decided. He's going to give everybody their articles for free. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, all the uh, editors know in this room know that I have no power to do anything. <laughs> it's really your publisher who makes those decisions. But, um, uh, but, but it, yeah. So I, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a difficult problem. But I also want to just say a word that the app that, uh, although our hospital. Is, uh, is part of the process. I certainly didn't have much to do with it, except I was Todd's biggest supporter in, in this app. But I think it's important to realize that this app is really in its infancy. I mean, the app is three months old. Uh, so we're, you know, barely out of the neonatal period. And so there's, there's growing pains and development pains. And, and I hope that in the next uh, year or two or three that this will be, uh, be really ready for prime time and it'll be a better product. But at the same time, Todd and his colleagues deserve a tremendous amount of, of thanks and um, 
for all the efforts that they've done so far. Thank you. Thanks, sir. So, Witt, I would like to compliment you on your presentation. I think if there are medical students, residents, or young faculty, if they abide by those rules, they will go far. There are two things I'd like to add to it. One was something that Michael Harrison told me when I went into his laboratory. And he said the most important thing to begin with is your hypothesis. And the most important thing about the hypothesis, it doesn't matter whether you prove it or disprove it. You know, it should be important. So whether you prove your hypothesis or disprove your hypothesis, that's the most important thing. And the second thing um, was what my wife tells me all the time. Before you start writing, look at your damn data, you know, and make sure you know what you're writing about. So, you know, you might not get to the results section until the third, the third part of what you're writing, but make sure you've analyzed your data and you know what's significant in the damn paper. So, because that really leads you into everything else. I completely agree. Your wife is obviously a smart woman. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, guys.